Hello, I hope you uh, all enjoy my uh, piano performance just now. Uh, well, good afternoon to most of you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with some reminders. Our speakers will respond to questions at the end of the program. So please feel free to submit questions at any time using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, we also have closed captioning available. To, to enable the captions, please click the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. And before we begin today's program, I'd like to mention some upcoming GSD events. Um, tomorrow, October 21st at 6.30, uh, the theorist Jane Bennett will join us for a lecture on the radical engagement of human and non-human activities. And next Monday, uh, October 25th at 12 p.m., we'll welcome preservationist and planner Andrea Roberts for a lecture exploring how descendants of the founders of Deep East Texas Freedom Colonies are leveraging heritage conversation to revitalize the cores of the communities. Um, so now for today's program, I'm very excited to welcome you to the Kenzo Tange lecture this year, a conversation between Kirsten Gears and David Van Severin of the Brussels-based office and Emmanuel Chris and Christoph Gantenbein of the Basel-based Chris and Gantenbein. Both of them have served as Kenzo Tange visiting critics here at the GSD, as many of you know, this visiting chairship was established in 1983, and along with the Tange Archive, celebrates uh, Kenzo Tange's legacy at Harvard that began when he received an honorary Doctor of Arts degree in 1971. Uh, the Tange Chair have since been bringing distinguished leaders in the field each year to teach and lecture here. Office had held a chair in 2019, and Chris and Gantemein holds the current chair of 2021. Uh, besides occupying the chair, both offices have enduring presence and substantial influence at the school over the last decade with many studios they have taught. I think historically speaking, you know, different generations had events or moments where their paths crossed for the very first time, you know, events that become watershed moments that fostered long lasting relations and, ex and continued exchanges. Uh, we think about the CIAM Congress of, uh, of 1928 or 1976, the Europa American Exhibition at the Venice Biennale organized by Vittorio Gregotti, or in the 80s, the Charlottesville tape and Chicago tapes that were held at University of Virginia and, and University of Illinois, respectively. Uh, but I think for the generation of Office and, and Chris Gantenbein, and I count myself as part of that generation, I think Ordo's 100 of 2008 was certainly one of these moments. Uh, for those who, who don't know, Ordo's 100 is a development in Inner Mongolia, uh, consisting of 100 villas designed in 100 days by 100 architects, uh, selected by Herzog Damron over a master plan developed and curated by Ai Weiwei. Uh, the architects were from 27 countries that included the likes of Vitalia Bauau, Moss, Tatiana Bilbao, Alejandro Aravena, Su Fujimoto, Barazzi Viega, uh, Mass Studies, Produtura, HHF, and, and many more. And it also included many of our GSD faculty, like uh, Toshiko Mori, uh, Scott Cohen, the offices of Imanis Kim, as well as distinguished alumni such as Euler Wu or Iwamoto Scott. Uh, although at the end, they were never, they were not built. I think Orders 100 marked for my generation in more ways than one, uh, one of these watershed moments. Uh, uh, at the end, uh, in retrospect, some of us think that maybe at the end, uh, Weiwei's interest was, was less about the 100 villas than that 100 architects was in the desert for uh, this period of time. And, and indeed, uh, I think many uh, friendships and, and uh, professional relationships were formed. Uh, many of us uh, knew of each other's work, but we never had a chance to meet tete a tete. And, and, and uh, I think those was, uh, all those 100 was one of these important moments. Uh, in terms of the, the background, I think both Office and Chris Gantemai needs little introduction. Office was founded in 2002, uh, both studied at the Belage, and they emerged to the scene with creating a series of projects of very different scales that ranges from furniture to houses to master planning. Uh, one could think of the houses from the early summer house to the recent solo house to commercial projects such as the Courtrait Expo to the new office building there. Uh, institutions such as the music, music center in Bahrain uh, or infrastructure from the first bridge in Ghent to the recent Tondo footbridge in Brussels. Uh, and I think two notable projects are also communication infrastructures, the RTS campus, which will house the uh, radio television Swiss uh, in Lausanne and the VRT, the Flemish radio and television uh, station that will be in Brussels. Um, uh, this practice has also combined academic research with teaching. Uh, besides the GSD, they've taught at Columbia, Yale, at EPFL, and uh, many places. And Kirsten holds a professorship at Academia of Mandrizio. 
Well, Chris and Gartenbein, they were founded a few years before office in 1998. Both studied at the ETA, I should really remember when they emerged with them, the scene with the uh, archaic tree pavilion in Chinua Hot Park. And uh, amongst the wide spectrum of projects, uh, they have developed, they had a focus and expertise on museums. Er early on in the career, they won two high profile museum projects in Switzerland, the extension to the Kunstmuseum in Basel, as well as the Swiss National Museum in Zurich. Uh, uh, and recent projects include the Lindt Home of Chocolate and the uh, competition win of the MACBA extension uh, done together with architectors who taught here last semester. Uh, besides the GSD, uh, uh, Emmanuel and Christoph have taught in various schools, and since 2010, they have been appointed as professors at the ETH Zurich, where they teach architectural typologies of the urban city. Tonight, they will be in dialogue, exchanging views on their respective practices and positions and their pedagogy. Uh, the conversation will be facilitated and moderated by our own faculty, Jeanette Kuhl, who has been a member of our faculty since 2016 and the founding partner of Karamukul, based in Zurich. In a relatively short period of time, Karamaku has flourished into a poignant voice within the field and accumulating in a series of award-winning projects of educational, residential, and complex cultural projects, uh, many of which were featured in the Crokey's monograph of 2018. And 2020, they were recognized by Domus as one of the 50 best architectural firms of the year. Um, uh, before the GSD, Jeanette has taught at Berkeley, MIT, and EPFL, where she edited the much reference books, a typical plan on office buildings and, and space of production on industrial buildings. Um, although this could be seen as a conversation among friends, I couldn't help but think about conversations or historical conversations that have been referenced to for that define a certain epoch. You know, when I think about uh, Peter Eisenman and Christopher Alexander's conversation at the GSD or uh, uh, Remco House and Bernard Chumis at the EPFL. And, uh, I can think of a better interlocutor than Jeanette to bring out the best between these two practices. So uh, you're all in for a great treat. And on that note, I'll leave the floor to you, Jeanette. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to now actually start sharing my screen. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so um, I'm going to get started. I'm, I'm actually, you know, very honored to be part of this conversation. As Mark was saying, I think it's a kind of a historical moment to actually get these conversations out in the public that I know, um, you know, Office and Kristen Gunterbein have had in private um, very often uh, already. But um, um, I think that this is really a fantastic opportunity also to sort of dive into a lot of their similarities, but also the differences. Um, so before I get started, I'd like to maybe just very briefly explain today's format. Um, you know, there are a series of topics and projects that we'll be discussing together, but um, we're not going to actually go through this as a traditional lecture format. Um, I'm going to be introducing the two offices through a series of diptychs. And we will use the diptych format as catalysts to look at their work, their ideas, uh, and their pedagogy always in parallel. So throughout this entire session, you will always see the works related to Kristen Guntenbein on the left and those related to office on the right. Um, these pairings, uh, as well as some of the, the kind of provocations are of course my own personal interpretations and you will see that they may indeed very well be challenged uh, by the authors of the works. Um, and so, you know, for, for the purposes of spicing things up, I will also try to provoke more of the differences because, you know, of course there's also very many uh, similarities. Um, Kristen Gunfein and Office are two practices really at, a, at the forefront of a generation that emerged after the exuberance and you can say the kind of digital formalisms of the early 2000s and came of age during in fact this kind of global financial crisis that started in 2008. Um, so their work and their approaches you know, may differ quite dramatically but one thing that really anchors them both is a kind of deep conviction in the search for an architectural autonomy. Whether physical or theoretical, their works in practice and in teaching confront fundamental design tools and elements, stripped to their essence and manipulated to respond to our contemporary condition. It's why a conversation about their work um, is a great way really to hit at the core of what we do as architects, you know, where our opportunities and our limits may be, and how, in fact, we make forms and how we make space. 
Um, so if we are to kind of construct a lineage of the two offices, you could say that Kristen Guntenbein have been influenced by people like Diener and Diener, uh, Hans Kohlhoff and Herzog and Demiron, a series of architects who are very much engaged, in fact, with the question of a metropolitan architecture, an architecture that displays a certain decorum, an elegance, and a kind of stateliness that comes from a, a self-assured relationship to a context of density. Office comes from a very different lineage, influenced by uh, firms such as Neutlings and Riedijk, um, Ablos and Herreros, and Xavier de Geiter, whose interests may have been less about urbanity, but maybe more about a certain directness and economy in the architectural language, and even a certain maybe humor and cheekiness uh, in the face of banality. Uh, it's an architecture of the periphery of European suburbias, where the absence of context demands an architecture that maybe looks inward. Yet, as they break away from their predecessors, their work begins to look for greater autonomy for an architecture that comes uh, from within architecture itself. And that search for autonomy, you could argue, reaches further back in their respective lineages to these two books or these two figures. In the case of Kristen Gantenbein, um, a pretty direct link back to Aldo Rossi and his architecture of the city, the idea that there are distinct typologies and forms that are provoked by the urban condition is something that really underlines um, their body of work from the buildings to the research and even to their pedagogical approach. Um, the idea that architecture takes cues from a history of architecture in sort of similar contexts. Office, on the other hand, seems less concerned by the city as a generative force, but rather by the historical materials of the architectural discipline, the figurative and configurative elements as proto forms, organizational strategies to be sampled and manipulated. And so these attitudes, you know, are, are nowhere more legible than in the plans of their works, um, plan as a site of contention. Um, and a uh, place you know, where, in fact, a lot of these, these ideas really get uh, played through. Um, but you know, this, this, of course, the similarities sort of stop there. The Kunstmuseum Basel is a negotiation of a kind of oversized program onto a very tight urban site. So its genius is a kind of massaging of function, a kind of perfectly functioning plan into a beautifully specific form um, that sort of gives subtle inflections um, to the movements outside, whereas, you know, Villa Buchenhaut is on the other, other hand, a very idealized plan, uh, a play on the kind of nine square grid, which is one of the oldest, um, you know, architectural plan types in the history of plans, uh, here taken, of course, to a new extreme of absolute evenness. And these same attitudes you can then find also in their predecessors, the inflection of the plywood house of Herzog and Demiron, very simple, but a very defining gesture of a house that courteously bends for a tree. Um, or Casa Mora, whose rigorous plan of no corridors really rethinks a kind of um, uh, you know, even field condition. So context here becomes also secondary. And so, you know, in, in, in this case, form is a very specific response to context or the lack thereof, um, whether as a tight urban context about the non-site of sort of Belgian suburbs and, and creating its own context. And these ideas, of course, are carried further into their later work, um, in each case, responding to their economic and constructive contexts, and each time really pushing perhaps to opposite extremes the understanding of our discipline as a material and constructive one, um, but also, you know, in each case, very much toys with our perception um, in the way that we, you know, share a kind of common history of, of uh, associations with certain uh, ideas of geometry and space. And, you know, again, at the heart of what they do really is the, the question of you know, the, the kind of architectural project and what that means, a question of how and why we do what we do as architects. So today's conversation will really be to unpack not only the positions that they hold uh, and the alliances that they make, but ultimately to talk about how they make those decisions. So I'm gonna start actually maybe now by just inviting, um, you know, Kirsten and David and uh, Emmanuel and Christoph to join us uh, while we get started. Hello, hello, hello Jeanette. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hello. 
Hello. Hi. So, uh, it's um, you. It's so good to see you all. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see so much, but I see orders, but I mean, yes. I can hear you in any case. <laughs> So actually, that was that that would be the first topic that I'd like to dive into. You know, Mark had already talked about that. Um, I'm going to just kind of go into this. So the you know, um, just to kind of launch this first chapter of this discussion, um, I'd like to actually use your two Ordos projects um, as a kind of comparison. You know, Ordos, as Mark was saying, really was a kind of defining moment of a certain generation of architects. Um, uh, all of you guys were really at the kind of rise um, at that time, and and really also that marked a time, in fact, of, of a certain sort of exuberance and star architecture in the early 2000s. And, and you can say that Ordos maybe was also a kind of turning point of that moment, right? So um, these are not, of course, first projects from either of your offices, but, but I think given the kind of context um, of these, you know, uh, extreme desert condition of this emptiness, um, and also at the same time, uh, the fact that, you know, this was really a, a kind of, uh, let's say, a hypothetical architecture, um, you know, how do you start in such a context? Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you start a project um, and, and what kind of constraints, in fact, do you impose on yourself? Um, at the beginning of such a project. Well, Jeanette, I, 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 we, we said we would, in a way, switch back to, to our shared screen you know, when we would have the conversation um, in order to uh, give it a bit of a, a feel of a dialogue, which is not easy uh, in this uh, yeah. Zoom context. I think none of us is a big fan of it. But, I mean, nevertheless, we're happy that we can have the chat uh, together. Um, as you said, and just to, to start the conversation a little bit, um, I guess we, we ended up in Ordos a little bit by accident, I mean, our office, uh, and it was absolutely not our first project, but it ended up being for ourselves uh, an important one, uh, a project where I believe uh, we tested certain ideas which were uh, already there, and I think the house you just showed in the introduction, the house um, in uh, Buchenwald, uh, was already, uh, if not built, uh, I mean, already designed. So, so in a certain sense, um, I remember when we were uh, asked to, to, to go there, uh, because we all went there, we met each other there, and it's absolutely true. I think it was the first time we ever met uh, David, myself, Emmanuel, and Christoph, and many, many others. And it, uh, I think it's been the start of a very, very important friendship and also a place of exchange. But, but if I look back at uh, ourselves uh, there uh, in the Mongolian desert, and in a way the absurdity of the context, not just because it was kind of a desert, but also that we didn't quite understand what was the exact, uh, I mean, was the power at play and, and, and you know, how we were uh, supposed to be, uh, how would I say it, uh, used or perhaps even abused. I mean, it wasn't so clear. Um, I remember very well we were in the, in the second uh, group huh, because there were kind of two groups. Um, and so we were already a little bit confronted with first ideas uh, for, for this development. We were given a site that was something of a lottery. Um, and I remember very well, we thought, wow, this is like a gigantic suburbia. And we were mentioned a little bit uh, in the introduction, uh, but where the, the house is not uh, yeah, 150 square meter, but let's say a thousand square meter or something. I don't remember the exact size, but it was enormous. So uh, I believe we were fascinated by this, uh, that there were uh, all different plots very close to one another. Uh, and at the same time, there was this in very big problem of climate. So, you know, we were dealing with uh, a place which was very hot in summer and very cold in winter. So I think very quickly we thought we wanted to build something which dealt with kind of, you know, uh, building underground, uh, because you don't see that so much in Zaxo, but in the way this square uh, is essentially underground, has no windows to the outside, only a court. Uh, and then this, this one idea, this figure, this room on top, which is even the servant's room, uh, somehow to indicate, uh, I mean, the stair to it, to indicate, uh, you know, all the questions which were for us unresolved. Uh, I mean, it was at the same time a fortress, as it was an underground house, as it was a, a palace, as it was a kind of a, a, a reverie, you know, like a, an imaginary uh, and I think for us, in that sense, it, it became a very interesting project because it allowed us to, 
to put forward some of these thoughts which have been uh, haunting us uh, ever since, you know, this uh, enfilade, uh, the kind of uh, the organization of a space, uh, a, a, a building which has essentially uh, no, I would say, uh, functional logic, but it's just a set of rooms and which can be inhabited in many ways. Yeah, so maybe just to kind of uh, take that on a little bit is that I feel what's striking is that both projects are in fact courtyard houses, very inward looking, right, um, very much about sort of turning inwards, but dealing with it in very, very different ways, um, though both, I would argue, is also very much plan driven. Um, so I'm kind of curious, and maybe, you know, Christoph or Emmanuel, um, you can also uh, jump in on this, is that I'm, I'm curious in terms of that approach, what is it about the plan? Because it's also at this time, at this moment, I feel like that there was a kind of resurgence as well in the interest of, of uh, really a plan driven type of architecture, where we start to see the configurations of um, let's say architectural space making really as a manipulation of the plan and in your case of course very much like that as well through the the ideas of these sight lines um uh and that that essentially get broken up so the let's say the kind of contrast of the plan to the actual spatial experience and what that actually means yeah maybe or i i, I can start and emmanuel takes over now I don't remember if there were other courtyard houses, but still it's somehow interesting that there are two courtyard houses and I would somehow have started to explain ours in a completely different way than, than Kirsten. No, Kirsten really seems to have been happy to be in the desert, no? to kind of uh, find uh, this absolutely homogeneous situation to create the kind of an ideal type. Whereas we, to be honest, we were somehow suffering from this missing context. Of course, the desert is a context, but somehow the desert is not there, is, is absent as there was were kind of 99 villas around expected, not existing yet, but somehow in the making or in the planning. So um, there was no context with, to which we could relate. So uh, the, the absence of a kind of a civilization or, a, or the, the settlement um, of, of human beings, of public uh, space, of a shared, of a common uh, shared space, um, somehow uh, was, uh, was the driving force then to do this kind of completely introverted mirror garden house, which um, which uh, avoids to be a building from the outside, which is a kind of uh, inexisting outside, but also somehow inside, <laughs> as it is through these reflections, um, um, a, a, a pure um, uh, non-perceivable uh, space. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's true. In that sense, we were pushed we were pushed in into a sort of an immediate crisis, and, and also you you would understand to come back what has been said before. This Ordos experience was uh, as much as it was about architecture or uh, a dream of a, of a new suburb. Yeah, it was really about these uh, one hundred architects or architectural offices to meet and maybe to a certain extent also to compete, you know? And it was, I mean, <laughs> it was extremely interesting to see how I, I mean, I myself, Christoph, how we would react uh, towards others. I remember Kerstin was this person who I met for the first time, very fascinating. Kerstin, you were talking so much and so fast. I was really, I was like, this guy is crazy, you know? And uh, of course it was also about, about just, who is the most present in a way, you know, in, in, a, in a very nice and also friendly way, but also in terms of content. And, and, um, and somehow, maybe I'm speaking for myself, we also felt a bit like intimidated by that, by that unclear uh, overpresence of all the others. And that might have led to this introversion. And, uh, and as Christoph was describing, that then there is this scattered plan. And you, Jeanette, were, you were referring to the culture or the predominant uh, role of the plan. It was a moment when we were very interested in working odd, uh, broken geometries in plans, but always, as, it, as, you, as you mentioned it earlier, it was somehow related to a specific condition of a very specific site. 
uh, for instance, our house in Project Volta Mete that, that we could develop at exactly that time was a research into the potential of geometry uh, uh, in the framework of a, tip, of a typological, of a typological um, and principle. Whereas then the Ordos was somehow the negation of all that. And we were very fascinated. And, we, and it was not, it was not a, a negative project, but it was somehow trying to test the limits. And we were telling ourselves it's more about almost erasing that idea of context. And we were telling ourselves, once you're in that courtyard and you have this mirror cabinet, as you, Christoph, was calling it, you would have the endless space of the desert of Inner Mongolia, something like that, you know? And uh, I don't want to become too, uh, too anecdotic right here, but it was interesting that Ai Weiwei liked Kerstens and David's proposal, I think, from the start. Whereas in our case, that attitude of breaking the space and maybe also putting into question the, the domesticity of it uh, was something that was very irritating for Ai Weiwei. So we had a very interesting conversation on that as well. You know? And it also led to variations of that principles, ultimately. I'm, I'm curious also because there is a very, you know, there is a certain specificity to the plan that you would think there is a specific reaction, you know, these kinks in the outer form, let's say, was responding to something specific. And I'm curious if that was, if there was a neighbor in which you were reacting to or, or, or how those decisions came about. This is well, just an offset of, 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 go on. Uh. No, 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 and I would leave uh, nothing to speak, but just a very short, very dramatic. It was a two-phase thing, right? So you did the first proposal, uh, you saw the proposals of the others, and the second visit, some people took or did not take uh, into account their immediate neighbor. I do have to admit that, and Manuel was right, it was funny, it was like you went back to school, so you got a little paper with your kind of the good and the bad points of your project, right? Uh, and uh, we got a, pro a little paper back from Iowa Bay saying, very good, that was it. I mean, so we decided not to change anything anytime. So I guess, well, you know, we never changed that attitude, really. <laughs> Love it. Whereas, oh, whereas I... I so Sorry, so, uh, I, I'm sorry, no, Tafi, no, go on, no, please, no, please. I, mean, I don't know, maybe Jeanette can ask the, the persons because, of course, we will mix at some point. But uh, so, what I would like to add is towards um, this desert context, which is for everybody, I think, sort of a mirror uh, in what are you actually, uh, as, as an architect, what, what is your position? And I think uh, by erasing any, uh, let's say, context, somehow you're projected to yourself and I think both practices and all the others as well had that same challenge and, and really enough uh, I think we can see both uh, projects here on the screen but they, they somehow are, are you could almost say self-portraits from a certain time of these practices and I, I, I find it interesting to see because otherwise um, in both cases there are courtyard houses I think anybody of us was thinking what would the neighbor do because we actually didn't really know uh, by the way i think we were next to mark and sharon if i remember well uh, but we didn't have an idea what mark and sharon would be doing but so you were a bit afraid of a, a kind of a tea park of architecture where everybody was shouting the loudest or the, the, the putting an enormous signature uh, somewhere uh, there in the desert. And so both apparently, uh, just Christoph and Emmanuel and us, we, we somehow made something which was kind of uh, opaque, uh, which tried to somehow reflect uh, on itself and, and try to make architecture in its purest from within. Mm -hmm. I think that also made the connection. I had a feeling that, okay, apart from personal uh, affinity, uh, I also very much believe that looking at each other's project, and we have a couple of other very dear friends, I, mean, I think uh, Mark here uh, equally so, uh, from that era, I think uh, it was an interesting experiment because since it was indeed no context, uh, you had to reflect upon your architecture and somehow you found friends who had similar ideas and at the same time also had of course not exactly the same idea uh, I, I remember that we even back then discussed the fact that both were quartered houses uh, and uh, in a way had similar interests 
but had another yeah, form and indeed had an interest in the plan and presented it as a plan and support. Absolutely. And that's, and so, sorry, it's just, uh, what, just one half thought to add, which I think is very nice and, and, and true what Kirsten just said. And in that sense, I mean, but I don't want to, we, we might come back to, to, let's say, teaching and pedagogy maybe later, but uh, in that sense, I mean, this was the greatest design studio ever, was that problem that Ai Weiwei was somehow giving to that whole generation of, uh, of us, this eager architects at that moment, because it was... It was it was so radical. It was so radical that it was really hard to take position. And as, as David was saying, you confronted with yourself. So as a as a psychological and cultural and ultimately political experiment, it's it's still quite striking, I believe. Uh, and it's nice to go back to that because it feels like history. Absolutely. So and I think that in a way, it's kind of the purest snapshot of where you were at that moment. And I find it actually curious that, Emmanuel, you said that you guys, in fact, were struggling a bit because I do think that your architecture is so much about that context. I know that recently we had a conversation and and uh, Kirsten was you know, mentioning that he thought you know, maybe you guys were like urban architects wanting to be suburban there and and that they as office was actually the suburban architects that are aspiring to be urban. Um, and I, th I thought that was actually a great way of sort of putting it um, with, with that particular project. So I'm actually going to share my screen now and, and um, share with you guys a pairing that I thought, well, since today, you know, it is the Kenzo Tange lecture, we probably should look at a Kenzo Tange project together. Um, and, and this is just, you know, of course, a kind of provocation. Um, there's Kenzo Tange on the left, which I've put in the in the camp of Kristen Gantenbein, and there's Shinohara's house on the right, which I'm putting in the camp of office. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a short comparison. You may not know these projects, or you may already know them. Uh, doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just going to flip through a couple of images of this. Um, in a way, you know, what's interesting is that both of these houses were built around the same time. And in fact, they're maybe just five or 10 minutes away from each other. Um, very, very similar, let's say, in terms of just overall, you know, uh, strategies and, and relationships to the ground, to the outside, um, but very different if you start to look closely. So, you know, you have the Tange house, which is all in wood, um, you know, where the, the tectonic of the assembly of the wood really is, is sort of driving that aesthetic. And you have Shinohara, uh, which is a kind of hybrid construction. There's concrete filled steel channels, um, you could even argue that tectonic was maybe secondary and a kind of a simplification as a means of challenging a tradition. Uh, and then when you look at the house, also there's some pretty major differences, right? Um, again, the Tange house is very much based on the tatami um, modules, very rigorous in the way that it deals with that, uh, that idea of this, the module and the space making. Um, and in the Shinohara house, a kind of reduction of the plan. Uh, really, you know, uh, the, the one thing also that, that maybe is jarring is, is you see the two paths. There's two exterior paths that leads, leads to the house. Um, the Tange one keeps the plan pure, and then the Shinohara one just, you know, sort of drives through the middle of that uh, ground floor. Then you go inside and you see also, you know, the Tange house with this overarching logic that really permeates the experience, really the kind of, you know, again, the tectonics of that being you know, a, a kind of driving force. And then the Shinohara house where a certain acceptance of, you know, maybe difference, almost a collage of materials uh, comes into play. And so I'm gonna just, you know, use this as a way of, of, of coming into the next uh, kind of question of conversation, which is what about the question of materials? You know, when should the question of material or materiality come to play in your design process? Or when does it come to play in your design process? I'm gonna stop sharing this for a minute unless you guys want to have this on the screen. Well, we should let the others start this time, otherwise... Uh, you know, uh, so, Christoph, Emmanuel? It's like a very slow um, uh, tennis match. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, Mostly, mostly, please, Christoph, interrupt me immediately. And we are not sitting next to each other, so that's a bit tricky. But um, for the tennis match, I mean, but uh, we are. Material comes relatively late. It is. Um, it's not. I. That's very. That's very honest. Um, let's say 
reflection of how the design process you were mentioning the context. I don't think it's so much about the context, but it's this tension between the, the general and the specific. So that space that is created through a presence of a given context. Also then our projects are in that sense, very scenaric. This is always about the story and the narrative first. And that leads to an urban figure, even if it's a small house. And, um, and there was a time when we were always this, describing our design process um, through this means of abstract white models, even though it's a small object, it could be an extension to a single family house, and still it would be the urban project, so to speak. And only then, at some point, once the, the figure, the volume, the type starts to take form or, or be, become articulated, or it gets articulated, then the question of materiality would come in. So we hardly ever. Um, conceived the building where the material was a given from the start. I think that doesn't exist in Christen Gantmeier's work. Uh, I might have forgotten the most important, but even Landesmuseum, you know, the, that concrete sculpture hasn't been always concrete. There were moments where that project was even imagined in a light, and this is our secret, maybe favorite alternative to the Landesmuseum, the, the, the undulated Eternit, this fiber cement, a big shed, you know, it could also have been light. So the materiality is something that follows the story. It's never really informing the structure and the type of the building. Or am I right, Christoph? Huh? I mean, it's not an yeah. oral exam here, but it's still. Uh... Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. No, I think the typology is a, is a solution, um, a solution for a task in a concrete situation. And and then uh, it finds its further development into into construction, which is of course completely different from from ancient times when somehow the material was a given. There was no discussion whether you would build in stone or wood in a certain place. It was there. No? Um, whereas what's I think kind of interesting is what's kind of interesting though in your works, you know, whether it's the Landesmuseum or also the the Kunstmuseum in Basel, um, there there seems to be a kind of way in which all the materials come together to to present really a kind of unified presence. You know, would, I, I, uh, sorry, no, Shannon, pardon. Okay. No, no, it's. I was just about to think, I mean, it's a very rhetorical use of material. And uh, yeah. given, the, given that obsession with um, this idea that the project is establishing a dialogue and relationships at, at, at many fold levels uh, uh, with its surrounding. And this is not just this, it's not just the physical surrounding, it's a sort of a broader sense of a context probably. So the material is used in a very rhetorical way. And, uh, and you were saying, it's a combination of things. It is about finding the right tone for that specific constellation. And we were then referring very often to a crossover strategy where we would use different connotations. So again, it is very, it's almost about the semantics of material and not so much about the construction and the tectonics in the first place. Sure. And but, then but, of course but, you try but still to- a way, it. The, Still a way that it comes together as a kind of, almost like Gesamtkunstwerk, right? That, that it comes together and it, it 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 melts together as a as a as an overarching idea, let's say. Because mm -hmm. if I'm looking, for example, at the Kunstmuseum in Basel, you know, when you go inside, the luxury, you know, the surfaces and the luxury that you feel of the surfaces in, is in fact sometimes by very ordinary materials, like the galvanized steel that you use in there, that actually sometimes looks like it's marble or looks like it's like some, you know, stone or something that's a, that's of a higher um uh let's say quality that you would imagine so yes i understand the semantics but i think there's this this desire no like for it to still come together somehow yes yes, yes. come together and also be um somehow uh, make a, an experience a feeling a sensation possible where you really yeah you experience the material in its surface in its texture in its in its haptics in its warmth or coldness um and and to do to do uh, to enable this you must somehow break the kind of the cultural connotations now that you mm -hmm. enter and say ah, it's a marble floor it's a kind of an elegant building because mm -hmm. that's not what is interesting no the connotation that marble is 
maybe used in uh, in bank buildings or uh, in historic palaces but what is interesting is the is the stone is its character it's is it's uh, the sound that it produces and um and this kind of uh, unexpected combinations um they help somehow to free the material from these cultural connotations <laughs> and what is also true, and that is maybe then our sort of harmonious psychogram, is it's not so much about the collage. I mean, maybe we will come to that in a, in a second. It's it's always about then bringing it together into one whole. I think that was exactly. a strong driver in, in most of our projects. Mm -hmm. where, yeah. where um, No, but to, of course, because it's a bit like you say, you play tennis, so we get the ball on our side. Um, well, maybe then, I do not think that we are pursuing about the collage neither, you see. I mean, uh, in the sense that, of course, um, it is fascinating, huh? because I think it's a conversation. You also, as much as you know each other, you also discover on how you look at your own work. Um, I think in our case, material comes late or early. It never really comes very early, and it can change, I think, you know. But then, here you're saying kind of the same thing. And we have also done competitions together, and I think we can somehow test <laughs> that indeed that's something we even easily share because a building uh, is conceived uh, or a project is conceived in a certain way, even with an idea of a material, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, uh, it needs another material uh, or a part of it. We have to think very differently. Uh, and I do not think that creates a, a crisis, even later in the process where a project, I don't know, due to shortage of a certain material has to be retold in another material, or due to, I don't know, a, a client who, who changes uh, her his mind uh, on that matter. Uh, we always, or, or simply economy. I think for us, economy has always been a big driver. Uh, we've been doing projects uh, for the most of them, at least uh, in a context where, I mean, there's relatively little money. So, I mean, you know, you have to be smart. And so the intelligence there is also being extremely flexible. But I hear you somehow saying the same thing, so that's okay. I mean, I'm also not totally surprised, of course. I mean, in, the, in, in terms of collage, yeah, it's not because we make collages, let's say. I mean, in, in the way we present our work, uh, that our, our, we like the collage of materials. I mean, I, I'm not so sure about that. I think we have a fairly narrow um, bandwidth of things. We're open-minded and sometimes here and there come in new materials. But I noticed that over time uh, we use a certain amount of things quite often because we, we like it. I think we like control. And, and if we know how we can manipulate something, we like to use it again. I know that's my feeling. There's a lot of aluminium in our office because I mean, we somehow know how to use it, you know? And, yeah. uh, and, and the same counts for, I don't know, dark green or something, you know, because we know the effect of it and, and so forth. And then, and then new family members come and so things change a bit. But uh, I don't know, I mean, I look at that. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, Kirsten, that you say that you like control and therefore you kind of craft your palette um, based on things that you, you've gotten to like, um, because there, there's a certain sense, and maybe Davi can answer to this, is that there's a certain sense also when we look at your work um, and the built work that there's almost a kind of a lesser fairness to it. And of course, I know it's absolutely the opposite, right? Like that, that you really designed to the last detail, but that there's, there's also an idea about how things come together easily or have the sense of coming together easily and, and therefore not necessarily completely resolving it yeah, well, maybe that's where maybe this word collage could help again. Maybe we're not making collages of materials. That's a bit, it's a bit easy to say, but um, but maybe if you see working as an architect as making lots of things, uh, you have a model. Uh, Emmanuel was mentioning it. You have a plan. You have a real collage next to it and you put them together but none of these things say the same uh, one is the black lines on a white paper the other is colorful uh, things coming together then the other one is made from i don't know what cardboard or wood or anything you find to make the model but weirdly enough they each of these things influence each other and i, I think we always believed in 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 uh, let's say a certain design process that is very open in which each of these, call it now, tools of architecture influences each other. And, and so 
And and then and I find it funny, uh, Janet, how you put the the, the house <laughs> of uh, uh, Shinohara at our side and the, the Tange at the other side. Well, I suppose you wanted to say something with that, but anyway, without expliciting it, I think both, of course, could count for both offices. But then again, uh, what is true is that there is a certain uh, call it. Uh, Kepsen was talking about the economy, economy of means is something that we often use as a kind of design strategy. The idea that you have a certain uh, budget, a certain attitude, a directness towards what has to come together and you show it, let's say, it, uh, in the most uh, essential way, I think that's also what we want to somehow investigate. Yeah, and I do think <clears throat> connecting with Shinohara, and of course, who does not want to connect her himself to Shinohara, but I think the mise en scène of the idea is somehow what uh, I like very much on, on, about Shinohara, which I think is something we very much look for. So that the kind of easygoingness, uh, the kind of less affair you talk about, uh, I believe if we are successful in a project, it, there's a sense of less affair because I say, oh yeah, of course, because it's a kind of mise en scène of an idea which probably takes an enormous effort to, to get there. Uh, but ultimately, it might be, oh, oh yeah, sure. You know, I, kind of, I, I get the idea. I, the kind of, I get the idea thought of, of, of a building. I guess it's somehow very important. Uh, if, I, if I may react to that, because I think it's a very interesting what you just said. You know, the, the mise en scène of the idea you said, or that kind of a theatral, kind of a theor a theatrical, and quality, which I mean in a very positive way. Also, maybe it's in less about indeed the materiality, but for instance, to, to, to bring it then, or maybe this is an attempt to relate what you just said, uh, is that the presence of color, for instance, no? And when I'm thinking of ourselves, uh, maybe our architecture, not always, but has often been about being that backdrop to, to urban, to the sort of the urban, the, the, the urban, um, um, collective, so somehow the buildings being dark and gray, which uh, one can debate, huh? but very often it's uh, about our obsession with the gray color or the gray tone in different in different shades, whereas the, the presence of color and the very strong hierarchical also um, um, uh, constellation of things that are very much put into the foreground by the means of color, for instance, and others that are more like um, disappearing. That's a different attitude, which I think is very interesting to, to speak about, because you were relating to that idea that actually the presence of the mise en scène, um, uh, putting on stage somehow of, of an idea. And, um, and no, but it's I interesting that the question of colors and material relate ultimately to that attitude. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 no I'm trying to so we try to turn it into conversation. Meaning, no, I relate to that. I, I, I think you're quite right there. I mean, but you see, since we have been exchanging so much in the last years, uh, we, we go and see your buildings, and of course, vice versa. And yeah, and also, I mean, I, I, I find it interesting the way Jeanette was uh, talking earlier about your Kunstmuseum, uh, uh, what is it, uh, galvanized steel entrances. And I remember very well even going there together and being totally fascinated, you know, because for me, this was uh, conceptually, i say, super radical. You know, you have this building, which is in many ways a, a super, I mean, say, elegant building in terms of materials, very rich in terms of materials. And so you have these kind of uh, galvanized doors and you forget that they're galvanized because you're so not ready for them to be just galvanized. <laughs> That you just take them as something really fancy, you know. And I never yeah, I think that's super powerful. And that's where I think you have a moment where, although the way you guys materialize things is perhaps quite different or slightly different from ours, that's a moment where we totally touch, you know. And uh, I thought that was a very fascinating moment. I, I, I was really, yeah, I was almost emotional, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, I was really, yeah, powerful. So, yeah. so yes, I, I think. And of course, you get also older in a sense as a practice. I mean, so so perhaps uh, first you do a project which is A plus B plus C, and then gradually, I don't know. Um, I think we recently also wrote about that. I think our buildings got much more robust. They used to be uh, lighter in, in the way they wanted to be. In it, in a sense, they wanted to say something in a light way. I think now they want to say less, and they want to be more robust in some sense. I mean, which is we'll get to that in a bit too. Um, 
I think there's a pairing of projects, in fact, that's just coming up that 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 will speak right to that point. But I wanted to kind of maybe quickly return to what you were saying in terms of the mise-en-scene of the idea, because I think that's also been quite central in your approaches, both of the offices, in fact, um, because I think that there's a way, I mean, uh, Emmanuel, you said that as well at one point, um, I think in an interview, that, um, you know, that, that the, the idea of the concept doesn't really exist anymore. You know, that in fact, the way that you approach architecture is through the idea. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you can elaborate on that a little bit, because I, I also think that with the work of office, there's a similar type of approach in the sense that um, it's, it's really returning to the kind of architectural language as a source. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear from your two points of views, you know, maybe you can speak to that and then David also afterwards um, on this topic. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll phrase. I mean, true. I mean, the concept is that uh, obsession. I mean, of course, every project needs a set of rules, and uh, and uh, and uh, and you stick to the plan ideally. Uh, but that our idea of a building is informed by by architecture, and you know that then there is the the design is informed by that by that. Um, Again, uh, the intellectual room that is created between something that we might call ideal. So an ideal, of course, in terms of um, uh, the, the, the meaning of the word relates back to the, or goes back to the, to the image. So that there is, there is something like from the start, an image, an imagination of an almost perfect architecture even though it's very raw and uh, it might be a memory or it's, or, it's a, or it's a plan or something, a drawing that exists already. But often we start with an idea that's a type of a building like this. And then, and then you start, but this sometimes happens very, I mean, even without the conversation, that then immediately this first idea, the ideal is somehow confronted with the real. And then there is the resistance, there are the obstacles, there is the challengers. And that then makes from the start its architecture, but the, 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 the finite product, the final form might nothing have in common with the, with the initial one, but it started with architecture from the start. And I think that's maybe a difference to something like a concept in a more abstract way, where, where I would speak of, let's say, patterns or structures or a tra uh, different, different strategies of translations. I think also when we were students, it was still common to many that you would look, I don't know, at a leaf of a tree and then this would inform a, a formal pattern and this then ultimately turns into a structure and into a three-dimensional space. This is something we were never really interested in. It, it started uh, strangely almost with that obsession that from the very beginning on you try to imagine a definitive building. And this is also a bit of a handicap. It can be very complicated to go that way. But I think this is how we try to imagine architecture. We start from the end. And I think architecture in the end, it's not so much about process. It's about the result, isn't it? David, what do you think? Is yeah. it about the end? Well, maybe just from the other side, uh, I, I would even say it's also something where we come in a way from a, a slightly different context in terms of ancestors. You showed them uh, before. Uh, so you have more the Swiss context and then you have our context where you have even brought in some Spanish flavor. But um, that's where we come from. And I, I think it's also important to, to somehow uh, say that that we are all uh, educated or, or grown, grown up in a certain way, in a certain context and in a certain architectural thinking. And you mentioned the, the kind of diagram architecture that came before, where we had to give an answer to. And somehow, I guess, um, learning from a bit before, and then you have Xavier Gert, you have OMA, you have Lindlings, you have uh, indeed Abel Cereros, Sejima, if you even want. I mean, this was for us our, the pool to, to also grab from and, and learn from. And, and I think uh, ultimately coming from concepts, we, what we learned is that it's almost like sampling almost as a kind of a way of each of these practices had a certain approach towards uh, materializing a project. And I think we, we from each of them learned a lot in the sense that 
you, you are able, and that was a kind of a freedom we had, uh, I would say in our case, office, that, that we had this, that, that potential. And in Belgium, you're also educated like that to, to kind of start from a small project and test lots of things in, in a one single family house, for instance, uh, you were showing the project in, in, in Burgenau. But we have many of these other smaller projects where actually all these let's say concepts or ideas you make ultimately get built quite uh, fast so it's not with a developer in between but you can have the conversation with with an actual person immediately and that was i think in in our context it's a very important element in how you materialize things there's also an enormous craftsmanship still in belgium present because every person wants to build his own house somewhere in suburbia and so there's many contractors many practices many craftsmen and so the growing up within this uh, moment was really uh, for us fundamental also in how to start to materialize things hmm. i mean i know Jeanette, you want to move on huh? because you show, show another screen but i still want to add one more thing if i'm allowed and i'll keep it short but i guess for us there's also two elements one which Davi mentioned earlier which is that ultimately we very much believe in the fact that each of the aspects of, of your, let's say, the way you make architecture, whether it's the plan or the model or the perspective, the collage, are slightly independent and only make a project together. So that in a way, if you do another, re do another recombination, it would be another project. I, I, I believe that's very powerful as a thought. And it's also very much related to, uh, I, mean, I think, your interest in, in, in art practices. And I think there, I mean, more than, you know, uh, the special type or the, the building and then how it's born and how it mutates. I think for us, we've always been very interested in this kind of, I would say, confrontation of different scales, say the difference between the model of Dan Graham and the actual pavilion uh, and support. I mean, the, the difference between an image and the way Baldazari deals with that. And I think this is very important uh, wave or has been a very important way for us to, to walk away from where we grew up uh, and i think there uh, avalos and Hederos and yaku is one i think they, they showed somehow and in fact through this very image you have here on the screen through um, uh, los angeles or banham um, a possible direction but now i leave it to you yeah no that's that's um that's actually fantastic because i i, I think that you know uh, in fact What's what's interesting, and and Kirsten, you were kind of hinting at that earlier in terms of the arc of your work, and so I kind of wanted to end here with your projects before we move on to briefly talking also about the pedagogy. Is uh, two projects that you currently had, and you know, of course, when I was thinking about Banham and thinking about which books related to each one of you, I had it in these categories. Meaning, I thought first of Kirsten Gandebein with the, the architecture of the well uh, in tempered environment. Uh, with all the kind of sustainability um, projects that you've been doing you know, recently. And then of course, office with uh, the, the Los Angeles um, for ecologies. And of course, you know, Banham is now coming really into the forefront of discussion again with the kind of ecological thinking and environmentalism. Um, but you know, then I saw these two projects and I mean, they, they both are fantastic projects. I really love um, both of them in, in each of their own kind of thesis in a way. Um, but it seemed that, in fact, you have flip sides. <laughs> and that's the thing that I wanted to kind of uh, posit here at the end, is that it seemed that if I didn't know better, I would say that the one on the right is Kristen Gundebein and the one on the left is Office, based on, you know, your previous works, let's say, you know, relatively similar projects uh, of, of typology, let's say, but in terms of the expression, in terms of the way that you engage with, with materiality, with, um, with the image, let's say, of the, of the building, um, but um, but but actually what's fascinating is that they are both deeply also very, let's say, uh, confronting the idea of, of uh, sustainability, of durability in very architectural terms. And I'd like to actually, you know, to discuss that because, of course, you know, we've had projects that flew the banner of sustainability for a long time in different ways, whether on a technological basis or, you know, on, on other sort of point systems and things like that. And I think we're entering a new era right now, which these two projects are very much at the forefront of, which is about thinking of um, sustainability in deeper architectural terms and what that actually means. 
So um, I'd like you guys to maybe, you know, talk a little bit about that. Maybe we start with Christoph, actually, since we haven't heard from you in the last couple of minutes. Yes. Um, yeah, of course, uh, the sustainability or the, I mean, the ecological sustainability, how we deal with energy, how we deal with resources. I mean, if we don't find a solution to these questions, then uh, we can give up our profession. I think this is uh, and um, this is really a development from, of course, Ra Rainer Benham, you know, it was the 70s who discovered that discovered these issues. Somehow they were always present. We knew about it. Yeah? But the dynamics that you can also convince clients to invest money, you know, um, that they go the way, and this is needed. Yeah? You cannot develop a sustainable project without or against your client. You need this kind of... Um, uh, alliances, you need um, their support, uh, and uh, I think uh, what we experienced in the last years, um, this is now uh, really going very, very fast, and uh, we see a fantastic potential in these questions of uh, energy resources and also um, material resources into really developing a new architecture. I think um, uh, uh, what this project expresses or these two projects expresses is that the typology developed out of its inner organization, how the staircase, how the ventilation is uh, positioned in a floor plan at the end leads to an uh, expression to the building. So um, we don't give up on architecture, but we, we use this, um, these questions of, uh, of uh, the energetic logic of a facade um, um, to produce a new architecture. And as I was just a kind of an anecdote, and I was talking about the, the importance of the clients. You now we, we, really, we developed a high rise building, and, um, and during the preliminary design, we said, you know, we cannot build this as a concrete construction anymore. We should do it in wood, but the client will kill us. Huh? And um, and this was how, and and uh, and by presenting it to the client, the client said, "Yes, we do it in wood," huh? because um, this is a completely new situation, and and we uh, could rework the project also on a, on a on a typological level on its expression, thanks to a kind of the innovative um, character of the of these new technologies, because they ask new questions, no, they 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 provoke new problems, and you need problems. To kind of uh, develop an architecture no? without the problem, um, you um, you won't find a solution. And 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 these questions, these um, somehow, yeah, ask new, uh, yeah, lead to new constellations of of uh, problems uh, where we don't have the solution yet. I think I find this we find this extremely uh, challenging and interesting. Yeah. And yes, and then, and then even, and then, sorry, and then even sometimes you have somehow to create your, the problem in order to solve it afterwards. But then I would like just to add something, and I'm not contradicting uh, what, what Christoph just said, but at the same time, there is just this simple, and I think humble, and at the same time monumental idea to conceive buildings or think of buildings that would last, you know, and I mean, I was... Uh, I remember we were giving a lecture here at the GSD, I think it was in 2015, probably, where we, and the title was the sustainability of form. I mean, the question of how, how long does it hold, you know, even though, even, even if, even when the problems change, you know, that it still could work. And I think the two projects that you showed by our two offices, uh, they try uh, with a very simple means of proposing, putting forward high, very strongly hierarchical plans that identify some fixed elements and the rest is open. I mean, this sounds super simple, but I think there is, uh, there is um, a clarity and, uh, uh, in, in these plans and a generosity towards maybe also change without losing its form and, 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 and um, character, which I think is very interesting. And, um, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's like, I think what's, what's fascinating is that you guys are both you know, treating this problem of the durability, let's say the lifespan of the building, but in very different ways. Um, you know, the, the Roche building really about the kind of centrality of the plan, this, this problem of the center. And I think with, with Office, your project in Kortreich, if I'm 
Yes, that correctly. Uh, is um, is is really about the, the problem of the periphery of the facade, um, but also how that how that could be, and uh, and and what alternatives we could have there. And I think what's mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe I would pass that now on to Kirsten for you to talk a little bit about this project because it is, you know, from your <laughs> trajectory something quite quite different, let's say, in terms of how you've been approaching. Um, well, yes and no, you see. Um, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier, uh, that uh, ultimately, but I would say always in an oblique way, uh, for us in our architecture, it's important to be able to show ideas. Huh? And then they should be so natural in a sense, the way you experience them, that you know we forget that the idea is there and it should be a good building, of course. I mean, it should also function. It's extremely important. I should not, I mean, say the fact that uh, you show an idea should not kind of make the functioning possible. But, but I think this it was important. And also when that question came to us to deal with a particular building there, and the question was even, should we demolish it or shouldn't we? Uh, I think an, an, another uh, aspect to our work has always been to be very interested in, say, the threshold or the perimeter in some sense. So, so we felt that uh, in this building, um, call it architecture without content or the big box or whatever it is, uh, what was fascinating that you, you could do architecture without actually saying anything about what's inside, because inside of the building is just there. Uh, and, and you should ask yourself if you decide to keep the building there, because that was the ultimate uh, challenge. I mean, the building which was there was a bad building. I mean, it was not well you know, in terms of uh, uh, its insulation values and this and that. So the proposal was to demolish it. But at the same time, if you would demolish the building, you wouldn't be able to keep a building there anymore because the rules, I mean, the urban rules had changed. So, so we proposed simply to make it, I would say, almost like Flintstones-like version of a building around the existing building uh, to, to show the consequence, but also to turn it into, let's say, an architecture uh, without content, which uh, deals with all these aspects of how much sunlight and how much uh, you know, uh, ventilation and, and, and all these uh, vertical elements you see, I mean, so-called the columns of the buildings are not columns, but they're actually ducts of the machines which we put on the roof, so that ultimately you can design uh, with this question. But again, to make it somewhat visible, uh, but in an oblique way. And so there, I mean, working on that very threshold of the building, injecting the building, you know, with that threshold, turn it into a new building, but remain keeping the, the existing structure, so not hiding the fact that the building could actually stand up itself, uh, what was for us, which was, uh, you know, at stake. And, and so there, well, I mean, it's not, it's not to us to say whether it belongs to our other architecture or not, but it feels totally as a, as a, a, a natural member of the family. Um, but it's, it's very blunt, uh, as we said. And, and, but I guess the bluntness is what we like about it. Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's there's this certain sort of directness about it. And so actually, we will need to be wrapping up soon. But I want to just, uh, you know, go to the last, um, let's say, just uh, topic of discussion, which has to do with the pedagogy um, that you lead. And I think that what's, of course, um, super um, interesting about um, the way that you've been um, sort of working with your students has also been about the way in which you look back at history and how you've been, let's say, reinterpreting, misusing, or, or, or kind of um, appropriating um, things from, from history and from the context. Um, so, you know, of course, each of you have had also a series of books that have been published um, from, you know, the, the teachings that you've done in other universities as well. Um, I'm just showing a few here, you know, typology transfer, of course, from Kristen Gantemein at the ETH, or, you know, the, the series um, of uh, uh, looking, sort of zooming in on certain architects um, that, um, Kirsten, you did at, at Lausanne with the difficult hole. Um, but I think that what, what is kind of interesting, and I'm just going to flip through these slides, this is from GSD Studios, also that um, uh, Emmanuel and Christoph, you guys taught here back in 2017 about the, the monument, um, and uh, also, you know, the studios that office you taught here, um, which is on American architecture, um, going through the American perspective, the American plan, and the American section. Um, and, you know, each of these really kind of looking at um, very, let's say, specific ways of, of establishing a certain process. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that kind of struck me is that both of you guys often talk about 
the fact that architecture cannot be completely explained or fully, fully sort of, you know, talked about. And I'm curious, you know, if you could not explain it, how do you teach it? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure whether we saw it cannot be explained. I think um, uh, uh, we have the obsession of explaining everything. So um, uh, uh, I, I believe architecture, maybe the really good architecture, can't be explained. But what we what, what we what we're doing with our students is is mostly to be explained. No, no. But uh, we are. It's of course it's about the method. It's about the it's about the working method. It's about a, a way of thinking, and I was referring to the to the storytelling. Uh, I think the narrative in order to create a context for your project, and that's that's I I think which that is a this is quite a rational thing, but it is uh, has a lot of intuition and also surprises and unpredictable things, and, uh, as mentioned before. It also changes. That's what we tell our, our students. You you develop a story a narrative, a scenario for your project. And while you're creating form out of that scenario, the scenario constantly changes. And so you're completely revising at the very end of the semester, your story would be completely different. It's always, that's what I'm trying to say. It's always to be explained, but the explanation changes over the course of a design process. And I, and, but we are very much insisted and also in love with that idea that there's always a rational to even things that are inexplicable. I think it is nice and important in an academic context that we try even to explain the inexplicable. I think this is important. And, um, and then the transfer uh, using pre-existing types or even typological examples and, and transfer them into a different context that you are creating that you're so this is this is more like a cooking recipe and I think it is a fantastic base for then an inspired project but it's in that sense not uh, enough to really make great architecture I think it is really something that helps to propel uh, imagination it is to overcome the concept we do not want to 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 discuss with our students abstract ideas and just constructing the problem and then and then the pro uh, and then the actual the actual drama of making form just doesn't happen so it's all about that form making from the very start mm -hmm. but along a rational line I, I might say I don't know maybe uh, David or Christoph and Kerstin you see you see it differently but we also taught along each, uh, alongside each other so um, there's always something to say yeah we are not, there is a Zoom tour away or uh, others, his disciples who would just sit in front of, a, a, you know, together with the students. And then there is, there's just nothing. There's everybody quiet. And after a while, they would say, I like it. You know, this is not us. Huh? I mean, we also like, huh? but uh, we try to, to understand why. So what makes, what makes, uh, Kirsten, what makes this, the plan and the section and the perspective American in those studios? Well, no, well, I give a short answer and then I give it also to Davi, but no, well, nothing, of course, that, that's the story, right? I mean, I was talking very shortly about it earlier that he said we very much believe in the fact that you have almost like aspects of different rooms which you bring together and, and together they say something else and each of these pieces separately, I mean, the, the most, I would say, evident example of that is Edward Shea's uh, word paintings, you know, that you have a kind of background of something and a word which seems to be something else. And together they say something which is neither the word or the background. Uh, and for us, of course, this American architecture has always been somehow, you, you, you would have a plan, you say it's American, ah, oh, well, it's American, so what, what does that mean? Uh, and that goes with the perspective and support. So, so I think we've always been very interested in, in confronting these elements. Uh, I mean, I've been forever fascinated by the typology transfer, uh, which is you take something, you move it somewhere else, it's absolutely genius. Um, I, I think there is a certain uh, connection there, but I mean, with us, it's always you bring that plus that plus that, and there's something else entirely. Davi talked about it earlier, that uh, the different aspects, whether it's drawing, perspective, or model, uh, do not say the same thing. And this really comes, if I may say so, from our experience, uh, students uh, with, with uh, Avalos and Hitlers at the time, I mean, they would make even competition panels, making a few plans, probably copying it from Jean Nouvel, and then 
the gluing an image, just a fragment of an image of, of this, an early Sejima project and say, this is our new competition entry. I mean, without, you know, without even uh, smiling, you know, they were like, this is it, this is the new project. And we were fascinated by that, I think. And then somehow, of course, through endless iterations and talking to others, um, and certainly with Emmanuel and Christoph, uh, this became something of a more solid way of working. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, indeed, I think you can talk about each of these aspects separately. You could talk about relations between these aspects, and still you have the impression you do not quite fully grasp it. I think if we say, you know, there's always something unclear, I mean, oblique, impure, imprecise about architecture, ambiguous perhaps, and that's its power. I guess that's true, but at the same time, each of the elements themselves have to be somewhat coherent and you have to be able to describe them. So I, I guess we are somewhere there. And I do not feel that we are far away from each other. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's, it's something you, you presented yourself, uh, this, this Bannon book, uh, the, 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 the architecture for ecologies. I mean, it's, it's also Bannon going to the States, looking at American architecture and learning from it, coming from European context. Uh, the same with the painting, the Hockney painting on the cover, which is the same story, an English painter going to Los Angeles and, 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 and as an English or a European painter painting American landscapes, I think, or, or paintings, I mean, not only landscapes, and, and it's, it's a bit this same exercise, you could say, like coming from Europe with a big fascination, of course, with the States, teaching in the States, what could that be in a new, uh, time as we are in today and how could this this fascination even uh, get a certain new life uh, like how because also these cultures i mean coming from europe then to the states going back from the states to europe it's something that gets altered uh, like modernism you could say in the purest european for, for version got to the states in the la uh, kind of lush version of, of, of the case study houses and really enough, we learn back from this case study house. And, and it's a bit similar in the, in the studios where, where we want to kind of do these overlaps all the time between Europe, United States, which fascinates us there, or visa versa. And that's really, and of course, the plan, I guess I'm saying it, is essentially uh, not American nor European, but it's the new plan we want to study. Huh? Yeah. And then also perhaps that the topic is never what you think it is, because Hockney's paintings are ultimately about gay culture. And, you know, and, and so, but that's not even mentioned, you know. And so I think that's interesting that you tackle life, that you tackle plenty of other things. I mean, topics, I mean, people often, I think, misunderstand uh, this argument, uh, autonomy of architecture is that it's as if we are these crazy people who think that, you know, architecture is for architects and it's about uh, the solid wall and I don't know what. I don't know we're interested in life. But we just uh, are I'm convinced that it's very difficult to talk about life. I mean, and talk about certain aspects of life uh, unless you talk in an oblique way about that, or you allow a certain story to unfold. Uh, and I think that's ultimately uh, fundamental. Absolutely, and I think that's in fact a, a great way to sort of close this off. Um, I'm being uh, asked to transition over to the Q&A right now because we're already, I guess, uh, quite a bit past the time. Um, but um, Maybe um, I just try to scan a little bit now the uh, the questions to see um, what has been coming in. Um, so Sarah Whiting asks, oh, uh, that's not a question. <laughs> she first has a comment. I'll read the comment and then I'll re read the question. She says, despite the challenge of Zoom, which makes me think less of a tennis match and more of the international phone calls of your youth um, with their long pauses as the voices made their way around the globe, this is a delightful conversation making all of us eavesdroppers on a European evening of discourse. Thank you. My question. Both of your offices have focused on the American context in your studios here at the GSD. Is that a nostalgic move on your part, invoking key moments in American culture and American architectural discourse, ranging from Thoreau to Venturi, or a confirmation of your belief in a contemporary architect American discourse, in, in which case, can you elaborate on what you see that to be today? Uh, so this is a continuation, in fact, of our conversation just now. 
Very good question, Emmanuel. What do you think? <laughs> I was tempted to say a transfer, uh, which is and uh, David was also describing it. And you were referring to Rainer Banham or to yourselves or to all of us. We are going somewhere. So a transfer needs a destination. And I, I think this is really it's about it's about um, uh, also maybe a, a room or a, a, a place to project things onto and i and i and we took the gsd maybe this is uh, in 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 a sense maybe nostalgic that that we still feel natural that we consider the gsd even though we now all meet over zoom we still consider it a place and somehow our ideas or our questions or the problems that we are trying to tackle we somehow maybe um related to that place, which is the school, which is Harvard in, our, in, in this case. And, um, but of course, again, the, the, the general and the specific, ideally we find, we, we find the questions and we, we make projects in the context, the American context that ideally um, reach beyond the US. You know, when we were trying to tackle or to, 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 to grasp the, the, the problem or the fantastic topic of the monument. You can say it's super, it's super American, but at the same time, it's maybe the most, the most uh, archaic problem of architecture. You know, is it, is it possible to think of monuments nowadays? And especially in the context of America at the time, which was 2017, which still was the Trump era. And, um, and uh, so, it was very inspiring. And the transfer, again, it needs that distance. It needs a destination where you go to. Otherwise, nothing happens. And that's maybe why the, Ameri why the American context is so important to us. And I still feel it's very inspiring. Yeah, but I, I, I do find the oh, maybe question I find interesting because, of course, the first bit of the story is an easy one. I mean, because we are European architects, you go to stage, you look, you take, you know, I mean, it's kind of, these false friends, you translate, you mistranslate, you appropriate and so forth, uh, which I think is, is a relatively easy one. And I do not see a big problem with idealizations, as long as you're aware of that in some sense. Now, the second part of the question for me is, is an interesting one, and it's much harder, at least for myself, to, to answer. That is, uh, you ultimately want this to bounce back, right? I think uh, our presence in a school like, like Harvard I mean, should have its effect to a certain extent on, on the American uh, architectural culture. And then I believe that, that that's very possible because ultimately it, it's a way of looking. No? It's like, look at this and don't look at that. Uh, realize that you have so many beautiful things which maybe for you are not so interesting, but if I manipulate them and about to throw them back, uh, they are actually a, a fundament of, of an architectural culture which I think hasn't been taken that serious in a sense. I mean, to a certain extent, you could say the American architectural culture has always been like, yeah, you know, the European modernists, they moved to the States because they had to flee and that's what they built and isn't it interesting and then voila. But I think that's not true anymore. I mean, there's a whole culture there, which of course we're not the first to discover that. But I mean, nevertheless, I think we need more disciples of that way of uh, looking at things and say, well, you know, you can start from there. And it's, of course, it's a corrupted history. It's a complex one, but every history is. Uh, and from there onwards, uh, well, you can build, in a sense. Christoph, you wanted to say something earlier. Yeah, I wanted to go back maybe in, in a direction where, where also David was talking about this kind of force and back, uh, which was extremely freeing kind of being so distant from from old Europe eh? and um, in this in this uh, monument semester which originally we wanted to go to Rome and then we couldn't go to Rome for technical reasons and we went to to Washington no? which is such an incredible project the city the city and of course modern America which is such such a radically modern democratic idea eh? America at the time but it somehow used architecture of the ancient times, no? the classical architecture, no? Rome, the, the capital, even Jefferson's sketch of the, of the river called Tibur, eh? Tiber. Um, so somehow uh, uh, this kind of, um, uh, yeah, it offers this, um, this scheme that we apply also in our teaching, that uh, the question, we have to be radically modern, no? and America teaches us huh, to be radically modern. 
we have to face the problems of the year 2021 socially, ecologically, politically. But the architecture we do must be informed by history. Yeah? And I think this is a, it's a big, uh, a huge um, lecture that also the United States and the, the culture of the architecture of the United States can, can teach us as we see um, how successful it was. Um, and we might also, this is maybe a bit bold, huh? bring back somehow uh, this, um, this strategy of, uh, of appreciation for, um, for a historic heritage of architecture that can be used also to be, yeah, to be used in, in contemporary projects. Excellent. So maybe we, we go to the next question. Um, this is a question from Joni Tom. Um, she asks, clients often have just as much of a role shaping projects as the physical site. In the absence of notable site features to respond to, they provide context and pushback on the autonomy of architectural ideas. However, they are rarely directly discussed or acknowledged as contextual forces in these sort of academic settings. Can you speak a bit about the influence or impact of clients you've dealt with in your projects? For instance, do you feel you're able to achieve the purest version of your architectural intent in your houses? Or was there pushback and negotiation on certain formal spatial relationships that diluted what you might have ideally liked to design? So, um, well, this is, uh, well, you can give a very long answer to this question, but, but then at the same time, uh, I guess the best architecture is made, and I'm sure we can all confirm somehow, with the client that is very open uh, to, to many discussions and, and really, I mean, indeed, as, as was said in the beginning of the question, it, is, it needs a very good client to also make a very good project. So, so it's always a kind of uh, uh, collaboration between, of course, the architect and the client. But then again, I mean, how, how can you steer that? How can you deal with that? In, in different ways, I suppose everybody has his own uh, style, but to say so, and 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 uh, I think we often say somehow, and so you have the, the idea or the concept or however you want to call it, and, and a certain goal, and and somehow you could say you have to also always choose your fights, right? Be very intelligent about which one is important for you and which one you could somehow leave out, and and that ultimately by choosing the fights right you can also steer the project and it gives you also certain surprises that you wouldn't be yeah, confronted with without the, the the necessary fights to take so so i would say um, even with the enormous uh, complex uh, and, and difficult questions that you get asked by a client your project gets better in, the, in most cases. I mean, there's of course examples where it's very difficult, where things really don't work out, but in the most cases, when you really understand each other, this just enriches the project. Yes, so I've just been told that I should be wrapping up this session. It went by so fast. Was, <laughs> I was really, I, I thought I had another hour to go and I really <laughs> wish I had because this is a, a really fantastic conversation. And in fact, a lot of the topics, I, I had to cut you guys off. I'm really sorry because, because of the time limits, but um, I hope we can pick this up again <laughs> a different time um, and thank you so much for, for you know, spending your evening with us today, uh, evening because you're all in, uh, Europe, I suppose, <laughs> and then the rest of those in, in the US. But, um, but thank you so much. And thank you everybody else as well. I don't know, Mark, if you're around, if you wanted to pop back in. <laughs> thank you. Thank you uh, for, for, uh, for Office and Manny and Christoph. And thank you, Jeanette, uh, for really a wonderful uh, conversation that you've instigated. I think there was so many things that was exchanged that could be impact. So. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Annette, and uh, yeah. all of you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.